Now we like Catherine, only having four Jacksons. Sword of pure magic, slaughter four dragons. Heat like corduroy fabric, door to door tactics. Easy like tortoise on boarded floor backspins. Rapping like the man that created it, and I just play with it. Shine radiant, raising it, sunbathing it. Voice tone sharper than razor tip when I aim it at megaliths, make them raise and lift. You can't relate to this. Even if you paint a pic of me and you and somehow make the faces switch. I like to babysit. Throw me the baby skin. Donated by natives that procreate in sin. They gon' need to raise the rim. They gon' need a cage in that gymnasium. I play the win, will still chamberlain. Put the globe on my middle finger and made it spin. They gon' need to raise the rim. They gon' need the cage in that gymnasium. I play the win, will still chamberlain. Even Damien and Satan is afraid of him. I heard the devil's Tasmanian. Raps made them spin fast, vast hailing winds. Abstract radiance underneath my crack cranium is gas radium. Hash cascadian, cash cascading in. At the end of the movie, the crack baby wins. Pack track stadiums, clap clap praising them. Tap that waitress, have crack crap. Peace, family. Welcome back to another episode of Underground Railroad Productions. This is your host, Brother Rich, back with the living legend himself, Professor Griff. Welcome back, brother. Greetings, Brother Rich, and it's always a pleasure to be back. We're back in stride again, man, as Frankie <laughs> Beverly and May say. <laughs> yeah, try to get the footing right, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing, though, man. It's a beautiful thing. So this is just I, I meant to call you or text you to let you know that um that um because I, I had posted it I wanted to call you first and let you know that I had uh, I've been talking to the brothers over there at World Star uh, Hit Radio and they want to do something once a week with me I'm like okay they said yeah they've been they said they've been listening to our stuff <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so I said I'll tell Brother Rich tonight when I talk to him. So yeah, man. So that's, that's world. Up. Yeah, I'm gonna, be, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be all world star trying to bring a different kind of energy, different kind of vibration over there. But they doing some big things over there, man. Yeah, yeah br- definitely bring that revolutionary energy over there, brother. Definitely yes, sir. Need it. Yes, definitely, sir. Definitely need it. I want to yes, talk sir. to you today, Griff, um, about a couple of things. I want to start out with this situation with the. Um, uh, the the white woman who called the cops on the black people for cooking out in Oakland, California. I'm sure you, mm-hmm. you're, you're aware of that story, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Th- th- now, it's interesting. Number one is, first of all, just recently, I've been seeing all of these headlines like uh, white people in Airbnb, a white lady called the cops on them, said they didn't wave to them. Then you got a right. in, in uh, Yale University... Uh, a black female got the cops called on her because she was napping. G- Griff, that, I, I, that's you? I can't. Yeah, yeah. go on. Oh, okay. Um, a black lady, uh, I think she was sleeping in the in the main do- general dorm room or something, got the c- cops called on her. Um, you know, the Waffle House. Um, and then there was this situation uh, last week. If anybody seen me and Red Pill, me and Red Pill did a video. Last week, uh, we was talking about Bill Cosby, mm-hmm. and uh, while we're filming, there's a gentleman that has named Kev that has a business on 125th between Park and uh, what is that? And Madison, and we're on his property filming. He has a backyard area. It's like a coffee shop. You could go mm-hmm. there and get the silk screen for your T-shirts. You okay. get all types of office stuff there. So we support black business. We go. That's where Red Pill gets all his clothing made at, shirts and everything. Right. There's a backyard area. We're filming in his backyard area, just me and Red Pill. All of a sudden, we hear a white woman screaming. You can hear it on a video. Once again, go back last week, the video we did on Bill Cosby. She starts screaming, telling us that we're interrupting her. Um, She can hear us um, in her living room. 
So we tell her, you know, we, we, we laugh it off, like, all right, colonizer, go back to your liberal. <laughs> you're, 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 it's uh, literally on video. It's literally on us calling her all of that. It's literally on video. So she goes away. We film about, tw- about I would say, 15 minutes later. She comes back screaming again. Excuse me, I can hear you in my living room. I can hear you on my property just screaming at the top of lungs. So that's when I, I, I press stop on the camera. That's when I, I got I, I got upset. And I'm, I'm telling her, you know, I'm telling her, like, yo, we're not playing music mad loud. It's 7 o'clock in the evening. I'm like, this, I'm like, I told her, like, she's crazy. Like, this is white privilege at its finest. We're right. talking. She's upset that we're talking loudly, and she has her window open, and she can hear us in her property from our property. So we're not a, we wow. have to keep our talking down. It's two people. Me, I'm not talking. It's just Red Pill. But we had, Red Pill right. not allowed to talk above a certain decibel. I mean, it, 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 was, it was crazy. We was like, is this lady serious? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So we, right. we, so we told her off. We kept filming. She didn't come back out. Or she didn't say nothing after that. But it was just like the audacity of her. So when I see all of these headlines, I told, I, I called Red Pill, I'm like, yo, Red Pill, we just had a situation last week. It got caught on video where a white lady got upset for us conducting an interview on our own property. She mm. wants us to stop our interview on our own property at, at 7 in the evening on a Friday night because she felt as though she had her windows wide open and she wants complete peace. Well, 120, she, this is New York City. There's trains, right. there's buses. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Crazy. <laughs> so, so I, I know exactly what's going on with, 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 with when I see these headlines, but I got to talk to you about it, uh, uh, um, Professor Griff. This situation right here, man, with this white lady calling the cops on Black the 911, it could easily get, got, could have gotten out of hand if uh, a certain type of police came on the scene and, yeah. and, and felt a certain kind of way toward black people. Uh, luckily, you know, the problem didn't escalate. Nobody got arrested. There was no tickets given out. And, and we're able to make jokes about it on social media. But this is a very dangerous thing that continues to happen in this country. Right. Uh, talk to me about this instance and how this and Just your opinion on it, Professor Griff, because... And, and, and also, what I told you what happened to me in Red Pill. Well, like you said, uh, Brother Rich, it's a con- it's a continuous kind of uh, I call you know a lot of times I, I go online and I see this situation people talking about Throwback Thursdays. Well, white people got a Throwback uh, Thursday also. They, white people, white people got they they throw they stuff all the way back so much so much so, Brother Rich. It's almost back to the Jim Crow era. It's almost back to the black codes, if you can remember, if you can remember them, brother. And it's and it's all it's almost really shamefully kind of put in a way where it really throws you back to the days where if you go back and look at some of these black codes, it fits mm-hmm. perfectly as to what's going on um, today, brother Rich. It says the black codes from 1865 uh, to 1866, in which it was a lot longer than that. We also need to keep in mind that there are two laws in America, the written law and the unwritten law. And the written law is not as powerful as the unwritten law. Mm-hmm. So this says the black codes from 1865 to 1866, the laws were passed um, in form of U.S. Confederate states restricting the civil and political rights of newly freed blacks. So you were free with the Emancipation Proclamation, Brother Rich, but yet when they enacted these black codes, um, which led to the Jim Crow era, the laws, if you go, the codes, rather, if you go over, are utterly ridiculous. There's a vagrance law, Brother Rich, that if you got caught more than, more than uh, a certain amount of time, too many black people standing gathering near one another, that was a crime. It says the vagrancy law and legal definition in legal terminology, vagrancy refers to the offense of persons who are without visible means of support or domicile while able to work. State law and municipal or ordinances punishing vagrancy often also uh, covered loitering, associated with repeated criminal prostitution and drunkenness. So if you're just standing around 
and they look at you and they look at you and say, well, you have no visible means of support. You will go to jail for 10 to 15 years, Brother Rich. Wow. This reminds me of that particular era that we came through in America. If you're minding your own business while studying, falling asleep in a common room uh, outside of a dorm at a prestigious university, White people can call the police on you because, according to them, you have no real reason to be there. But we have to also refer and go back to the definition of racism and white supremacy that Dr. Francis Cress Wilson gave us. And I'm not repeating this just, just for the fact of this particular um, interview, Brother Rich. I think this is a, uh, um, a uh, practical definition that all of us, especially black, need to keep in the forefront of our minds. Definition of racism and white supremacy by Dr. Francis Cress Wilson. Racism and white supremacy is the local and global power system and dynamic structured and maintained by persons who classify themselves as white. Now, just with that alone, that's one sentence, Brother Rich. There's so much in that that we could break down, but for time's sake, it's a local and global power system and dynamic. These people were barbecuing. She came and read an ordinance and uh, basically stating that you could barbecue, but you just can't use charcoal. And she stood there for two hours trying to get the police until another woman confronted her. So if this is, it's a, it's a power system and dynamic, 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 pardon me, structured and maintained by persons who classify themselves as white, whether consciously or subconsciously determined, which consists of patterns of perception, Logic, I need you, we've got to listen to this, Brother Rich. Mm. It's patterns of perception, the pattern of how they perceive us. So if you put it on the news 50 times a week, you put it on social media, automatically in a young white person's mind, in the hipster's mind, the young white person now that lives in these areas now, and which are the ones that are responsible for gentrification, all right, it's patterns of perception, how they perceive you, you're automatically a criminal. Mm. Logic, because they don't use logic, symbol formation, thought, speech, and action, and emotional response as conducted simultaneously in all areas of people's activity. And those areas are economics. You're barbecuing, you're in a park, and we know you, you don't live in this area because you can't afford to live in this area. Education. You don't have the educational fortitude, Brother Rich. You haven't reached that degree in our system in order to afford to live in this area because of justification. We moved you Negroes out. So I know you don't have the education um, uh, fortitude to even afford living in this area, so you can't even afford the barbecue. Entertainment. The brothers weren't playing music live. They were peacefully chilling, barbecuing in the park. Labor. Why are you barbecuing in the park in the middle of the day in the old day when you must not have a job? See, this is their thinking, Brother Rich, according to Dr. Francis Cress Wilson's breakdown of the definition of racism, white supremacy. Law. You're breaking the law. I'm calling the police. Politics. Politics is the science of governing people. And we know how we've governed you, Negroes, and we know we've given you vouchers to move outside of the city limits. So you don't belong here anyway. Religion. We've done enough in religion to make sure you worship us. So when we show up on the scene, you should be intimidated and feel like start packing your stuff up because we're going to call the police. Sex. Two more, brother. Rick. Sex. Um, you really look like a, a black boot. But subconsciously, I desire you. So if I can't control you and manipulate you and tell you what to do, um, I will call the police on you. Because I really truly desire you, though. Mm -hmm. But since I'm 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 out of shape and I'm fat, and I need to be jogging around the park instead of standing for two hours waiting for the police to come. You're, I'm 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 not desirous to you, so uh, I'll threaten you. Last but not least, war. We need to keep in mind that we are at war, brother Rich, as sister soldier taught us a long time ago, and these people are not going to let up. All right, their first line of defense is their so-called laws. Their religions, the nine, the eight other areas of activity that I just read. The second line of defense is their police department, mm -hmm. and we need to understand that if, I, if they can't get us to move by a verbal command, 
They'll call the police on us, and knowing that the police are going to come and be on their side uh, mm -hmm. uh, to get black people locked up. So that's my take on it, brothers. If they barbecuing in the park, come on, man. What, what, what's the offense if you're not bothering anyone? You and Red Pill weren't bothering anyone. You're on private property. But yet they deem it necessary all right, to harass us at every turn because this is at the base of who and what they are. You see, Brother Rich, racism and white supremacy enacted these ordinances and these laws to put us back into slavery. And the question I want to ask at the end of this answer for this first question that you asked, what's stopping them, Brother Rich? Hmm. What's stopping them from rounding? What's stopping them from rounding all of us up right now and putting us in slavery, putting us back in chains, putting us back in internment camps and concentration camps? Let, let me ask you this, Professor Griff. Should should we respond the same way in terms of if you see a white person doing anything, oh, I'm going to call the cops. You you shouldn't be smoking the cigarettes uh, in, in this park or you shouldn't be in the park after a certain time or or I see you hop the train or any little thing we see. Uh, are, should we re uh, respond <laughs> by acting the same way that they act toward us, Professor Griff? And I don't want to generalize all white people, but I'm talking about these situations. Well, you know, Brother Rich, it's, 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 it's a double standard in America. And um, let me give you a case in point. Chase, you're walking through the airport. Um, over the intercom comes a, a very um, stern kind of law enforcement kind of voice. Or you might even see it on the, on the, on the television screen throughout the airport. Um, uh, if you see something suspicious, please notify uh, law enforcement or, your, uh, or police officers that are in the airport. You ever heard that? You yeah. ever saw that? Yeah. Okay. But now, what is suspicious to you, Brother Rich? So, Brother Rich, when we talk about what looks suspicious, what looks suspicious to the average white person definitely doesn't look suspicious to me. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, they may look at you. You may be having a rough day. You may have hung out at the club last night. You may have showed up at the airport um, just with one piece of luggage, walking, walking through with some shorts on and a hoodie on, right? You may be walking through with your pajamas on and a blanket around you and a bonnet on your head, which I've seen a lot of black people do. You understand what I'm saying? With a hoodie on or something. See, that's not suspicious to me. See, but a white person looking at that, that may be kind of suspicious. Am I right or wrong? Facts. Okay, a seat. Indian, or Imam, Muslim, two different parts of the world, two different countries, two different religions. White people don't know the difference. They often call the police, saying that there's a, a, a Muslim terrorist that's on their property or causing trouble or whatever, and end up being a brother from India. You understand what I'm saying? See, what looks suspicious to us may not look suspicious to them and vice versa. All right? I see the average white man nowadays, I automatically think serial killer. <laughs> I automatically say colonizer, raper, the rapist. You understand what I'm saying? Um, bombing countries, stealing natural resources. Automatically now, when I look at white people, I'm like, oh, okay. Because what looks suspicious to them may not look suspicious to me. When I go to a restaurant and I'm not being mindful of the signs, and it could have been a sign out front and said, um, dogs are welcome and allowed. And white people are sitting there feeding their dogs or having the dogs sit next to them while they eat. You see, that's suspicious as hell to me. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. I don't know whether or not you're having sex with the dog, if you're dating the dog, or what the fuck, whatever you're doing. That's suspicious as hell to me. But it may not be suspicious to the average white person because this is part of their culture. So there's a difference on what looks suspicious. You know, in the airport, Brother Rich, where they got cameras, Eye retina scans, facial recognition software, all right? Police, two or three police on every concourse, response emergency team, SWAT. Brother Rich, I've been handcuffed and been down under um, Hartsfield International Airport to their jail. So I know what the hell they got down there. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Who's going to try to pull something up at the goddamn airport? You're walking through with your goddamn pajamas on, some strippers on, and a body and a hoodie. You understand what I'm saying? So what's suspicious to them is not necessarily suspicious. So to answer your question very directly, you got damn right. We see them doing something suspicious, we should call the police. 
Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, case in point, trying to act black. No, fuck that. Next time I see them trying to act black, black I'm just calling the goddamn police. <laughs> What's your complaint? <laughs> no, I'm only playing. I ain't that damn petty. But I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm saying, if it's within the law, if this is the behavior, then I guess we have no other choice, Brother Rich. But we're truly wasting our time because we just don't get down like that. Right? In most cases, we see a scrap going down outside, some two people fighting. If we know them, we might break it up. But if we don't, we like, oh, damn, it's about to be on. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So we, there's just two different ways we conduct ourselves, and there's two just different uh, behavior modes that we're in. Plain and simple, man. We, we tend to mind our business about things. You know, you talked about, you just mentioned um, acting black. Um, I noticed there's, I don't know if it's a rise or maybe I'm just noticing it more, but on Instagram, uh, there's a lot more people putting on this hip-hop routine. Um, you got the, the girl the girl that was on, I think, Mari, one of them talk shows, the Catch Me Outside Girl. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they, I guess what they consider acting black, they go around, they talk black, they have black friends. They got the girl, whoa, Vicky, who she, um, goes around saying she's a millionaire. They got the little Asian girl, little Tay, mm-hmm. who goes around cursing. I think she's like nine years old. They said her mom just got fired because they found out that her mom films her own videos. But I'm just noticing more and more people with this kind of, this hip hop kind of act that they put on. You know, they use slang. They they try to use the latest slang. They dress a certain way. They hold money phones to their ear, the money to their ear like they see black people doing. And they're getting huge followings. I'm talking about in the millions. Uh, what do you what do you think? Why is this so interesting in 28? We've done seen this year after year after year. Why is this still so interesting in 2018 to the world to see white people or Asian people or whoever put on this so-called black persona, Professor Griff? I hate to be redundant, and I know people are tired of me reading this, but we just read it. It says racism, white supremacy. I'm going to the middle of it. It says whether consciously or subconsciously determined, which consists of patterns, Brother Rich. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it operates in all areas of people's activity. All you did was just cover the entertainment aspect. Mm-hmm. And this is for this is to prevent white genetic annihilation. They kind of figure if they kind of act black, they won't be perceived by black people as the colonizer, as the one that they should to, uh, redirect their anger um, towards. So white people want to fit in. I saw some of these YouTube clips. There's a young white dude on YouTube just crying to his mom. He just wants to be black. I right, mean, it I've looks like it. I've seen it, yeah. And it's like, wow. It's just something about black people. You see what it is? It's, 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 a, uh, it's a love-hate relationship. They, they, they love hip-hop, but they hate where hip-hop came from. They love black culture, but they hate black people. They love how we walk, our swag, our talk, how fly we are, how we dress, how we make something from nothing. You understand what I'm saying? But they hate us at the same time. They will use us. They will see us in how we do things, um, even, in, even, even with comedians, even with uh, actors and actresses. They'll see how we do things. They'll make money off of us. They'll profit off of us. All right? But they won't respect us. Um, uh, case in point, Monique. Do you understand what I'm saying? Monique compared herself the scrawny little white actresses and comedians and that kind of thing, and she saw it firsthand, racism, white supremacy, at work. And this is real, even in the area of entertainment. So we have to understand this particular dynamic, uh, Brother Rich, is subconsciously determined that sometimes they don't even realize how disrespectful they're being. They think that they're being funny, but they don't understand that black people in some cases had to do these things and act this way just to get through so we don't get lynched or castrated or sold down the river. So we had to make white people laugh. But we couldn't laugh without their permission, Brother Rich. 
And I know the people listening to that say, oh, get the hell out of here, Professor. Go look it up. If you, if you disagree with what I'm saying, go look it up. They had this thing called laughing barrels, Brother Rich, that they all had on the side of the road. We couldn't laugh in front of black pe- white people. If we found something funny, we had to run, go stick our head in a laughing barrel, laugh, and then come out with a straight face because we couldn't laugh without white people's permission. Wow. So we had to understand this particular dynamic. And then, turn around, we would watch them dress up in blackface and entertain, and, uh, and emulate us. And imitate us. So when you go look at all those um, funny little kind of comedy things where they dress up in blackface, those are not black people. Those are white people. A lot of them have admitted, Brother Rich, they can't even be themselves unless they blacken up. Ronald Reagan wrote a book called Where's the Rest of Me? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it has this fascination. And, and see, we have this melanin, and the melanin creates this magnetic pole, and it draws them to us. It draws everybody to us. You understand what I'm saying? We just have a certain way we do things. We have a certain rhythmic kind of swag that we have when we walk the planet. All right, people notice it in the way we do things, and this is just commonplace with black people, and we don't even try. I noticed about twenty trends that came up when I was growing up, brother Rich. Remember? I don't know if you old enough to remember. We remember Lee jeans? Yeah, yeah, I do. We took we took the Lee the patch off the back where the belt buckle would be, the belt would be, and we put it on the side of our pants leg. Because we want people to know we were wearing Lee's. You understand what I'm saying? And the yeah. reason why we had to take it off where the belt was because we wore our shirts down. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, why? That's just who and what we are as the people. We could create a dance like tonight. And people in Japan will be doing it tomorrow. They care about started with a few dudes standing out on the corner, man. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Anyway, in the cold because they were, they were shivering. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I forgot about the Baycade bounce, man. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you giving us a history lesson tonight, man. No, I'm serious. <laughs> we just come up with these things because it's who and what we are. We can, we, we can make it up like right now as we speak, and they'll be doing it around the world, and it'll be a big thing. But it won't get recognized, and we won't get the credit for it, but they'll give Becky the credit because one of us validated Becky to come in and we taught her how to do it. Well, she hanged with us so much she think we black. You seen the uh, the um, the Dolce, uh, uh Netflix film? The woman who thought she was black? Yeah, I seen it. I seen it. Mm, 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 mm. I, I looked at that and I said, wow, look at the depth of this pathology here. This yeah. woman is sick. You, there's obviously white pictures of you and your white family. How are you going to put on, uh, braid your hair and put on some makeup and all of a sudden you just want to be black? In my mind, I'm saying, look at the sickness in this woman's mind. What you want to be black for? You see, she's comfortable with being black when she wants to be black. She can easily go home and wipe that makeup from makeup wipes and take them damn car rolls out of her head. She could be a, a white woman tomorrow. You understand what I'm saying? You see, they don't want to know what we really go through. Dave Chappelle asked that question at the 25-year 20, uh, history of Def, Jam, Def Comedy Jam. They don't really want to know what it is to be black in America, man. They don't want to walk in these shoes, man. They know they can't take it. Jane Elliott, I was supposed to do an interview with last week. Jane Elliott put it to the test in a room, a class, a room full of white people, all right? Stand up. Every, all the white people stand up if you want to switch places with black people tomorrow. Hmm. No, one, no one stood up, Brother Rich. No one wanted to trade places with us. Not a day, not for a week, not a month, not a few hours. Because they, under, they, they understand. They don't understand the depth of what we go through in this black skin. With these thick lips and this black skin and this kinky, curly, coiled head, which is a connection to the cosmic forces. And we see them watching us. They want to emutate us, emulate us, but they don't want to be us. They don't really want to be us. They want to well, be us when it's convenient. There's a video, uh, Professor Griff, that's been going around. Uh, I sent it to you because we we just did the show on um, last week 
on uh, the This Is America video by Child mm-hmm. Gambino. You right. know, it's viral. Uh, it's over 100 million views. So there's a female, I, I think a YouTuber by the name of Nicole Arbor, who did uh, what they're calling a, a mayonnaise version of the track. And it, it, it's catered toward uh, feminism. And uh, people are extremely upset, man. I mean, shit. And, and, and it seems as though nothing's sacred. And it seems as though, you know, like how you said, everything gets stolen. And um, one of the tweets that she wrote in the past, she said, and, and you know, with you, with, with, considering what you just said, uh, her tweet was concerning cultural appropriation. She said, in reference to it, um, your shit is just cooler. I'm not trying to appropriate and still... I just really effing like it. So she said that in 2015, and she just did the video because I, she, I she did it for um she had a skit that she did for dear white people. So she has a habit of doing this, and she's just like, hey, grip man, this shit is just cool, man. I can't help it. So what 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 would you say to a person that that says she that says that she grip? I'm not trying to appropriate. This shit is just so cool. I can't help myself. What so why can't you? Be? Why can't you uh, admire it from a distance? Why can't you give it the credit and, and give it its just due and admire it from a distance? Why do you have to take it and put yourself in, in the middle of it and now you're the star of it? You follow what I'm saying? And then you'll sprinkle some black people in it to give it its authenticity. Mm-hmm. So that when black people do see it, like, oh, they, my girl Tanya was in it. My, yeah, she's like, my girl... <laughs> You know, my homegirl dead there but then so it's cool. No, it's not cool. It, 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 it's not cool. And it is cultural appropriation because you're actually taking our culture. You're doing the same thing that the Vanilla Ices and the Elvis Presley's and the rest of them have always done. You're taking our culture. You're pretending like you're us, moving, sounding like us. And you, you, under the guise of comedy, you're trying to pull something off that's obviously not funny. You definitely didn't give that particular video, because I watched the video. You didn't give that towards who and what we are. You must have been talking to a, a segment of people that laugh at those corny jokes of yours. It was not funny at all. What Charles Gambino gave us was a deeper look and a deeper introspection, not introspection, a deeper perspective uh, look, rather, from his perspective, looking at racism, white supremacy, through the lens of what we would normally see, a black video, we would normally see flash people throwing money, flashy, bling bling stuff, half naked women, the disrespect of our own people. You understand what I'm saying? There's a number of things that we would see. But what he did was he went back and looked through the lens now of a black man that would be perceived as being conscious. And he flipped, his, he flipped the script and he made us look through this lens and ask us a question. Are y'all really watching this? Because this is America. What he was actually saying is this is America on how we see America. So all he did was hold the mirror up so people could see America for what America really is. White people just, I've said this um I'd say about eight months ago, you brother Rick. White people just need to stop. Stop. And I want to ask white people a question right now because I know they're listening. Uh oh. What is it that that white woman could have actually pulled from white culture that she would have been satisfied with? I'm gonna ask that question again. I don't want to talk too fast. I'm from New York like you are, brother Rick. So let me slow it down. What is it in white culture that the average white woman? "Quote unquote comedian could have went to white culture and said, "Okay, what can I do? What have white people actually created that I can pull from to get my day going?" Let's answer that question, brother Rich. There was a time in white comedy where white comedians did their thing, especially with silent film before they were sound. The Charlie Chapmans and the, the rest of these kind of characters, all right, slapstick comedy they called it, all right. And even, sh- sh- and even after that, they didn't allow black people in, definitely not on the screen. And then when they did, we had these subservient kind of roles that we had to play in the film, and we couldn't have any other roles until the Sidney Poitiers and, and, um, and the, these people came on the scene. 
All right. So I'm going to ask the question again, Brother Rich. Where is it in white culture that she could have went and pulled something from white culture to entertain herself if she really, truly wanted to be funny? Let me answer that question for you, Brother Rich, and some of the people that, that, that's trying to answer this in their mind. Nothing. Nothing. If you look at the landscape of culture in America, the vast majority of it comes from black people. Any and everywhere you look. We had a recent, and we're probably in the, in the, in the thrust of it right now, now that Donald Trump has agreed to hand over almost a billion dollars and to give to treatment centers that's going to treat white people for opioid addiction. When black people went through uh, the same kind of trauma with the, uh, an addiction of our own, be it crack or anything else, but they treated us vastly different. Am I right or wrong, Brother Rich? That's facts. So there were those white people that were supposed to have came to our aid then if you love black culture so much. Where was the billion dollars, Brother Rich, to set up the clinics? Instead of them criminalizing us, why didn't they say, okay, this person is sick. It's a health issue. You criminalized us, and then it was a criminal issue. But when white people get addicted, it's a health issue. That's a big, gigantic uh, gap in how, A, you're using funds, B, how you view uh, human suffering. So we have to understand that. But none of these people, Brother Rich, that you see now want to emulate black culture and be funny now all of a sudden and do the things we do and hang out with us and dress and talk and walk like us and this kind of thing. You never see them on the scene when it comes to these serious issues. Why is it always that when you want to be funny and you want to play that you show up on the scene, but at the same time, uh, simultaneously, black people are suffering? Where were these people? And I'm not negating the fact that the Tim Wise is out there and Jane Elliott's are out there and and I could even mention Jordan Maxwell and some of the other people that yeah, speak to some of these things. Um, I dare to mention Alex Jones to some of the people listening to this might jump on me. You understand what I'm saying? But we, we, we have to admit that a lot of times when I sit back and listen, I'm thinking white people are talking to other white people. And I just happen to walk in on the conversation. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, we still pull from the conversation. We still pull some jewels from the conversation, and we have to admit that. I've known several scholars that are in their work. I hear Zach- Zachariah Sitchin's work. You understand what I'm saying? I hear other white people's work. So we can't deny that. But I'm saying in all seriousness, when black people are suffering, how come we don't see these people? How come we don't see the white comedians? And people that, that try so hard to be black. That's true. That's just a question. Because I know they're going to question me. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, no, definitely. They, all, they, they always do. They hold every word I say. When, you, when we finish this and you post this, every word I say, they scrutinize it. And I, and I read some of the things that they say. It's like, wow. Okay. So you, I'm going to tell you like Cardi B said. So, but because I barely made it through high school, but because I managed to slip through the cracks, because I managed not to go to jail, I managed not to get caught up and hung up on drugs. I don't never took a drink, never smoked anything. I came up in from, from a young age. Um, I was on this path, wanted to be conscious, wanted to be a strong and responsible black man to the black community. Oh, but because I slipped through the cracks and I managed to get to this point, and but because I don't speak the king's English, and I trip over a few words and that kind of thing. Thanks for the lesson, Cardi B. I trip, it's, it's, it's slip, slip up with a couple of words and a couple of phrases, and I might use the word out of context of this kind of thing. You judge me? <laughs> it, it put me in time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, Brother Rich, I, I would guess if I snatched the people from their homeland and brainwashed them and traded their, their, their wealth for my God and all this kind of stuff, and I beat their religion out of them, and I beat their way out of them, and I beat the ancestors out of them, and I beat their language and beat their names out of them, then I turned around and made them speak my language. 
Yeah, you damn right. In 2018, you'd be stumbling over some goddamn words. You're fucking right. So we not to be, we can't judge one another based on that. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Elijah Muhammad had a third grade education and shook the world. Sidebar. <laughs> <laughs> I got a, a what, what, what more? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I got to, I got to end that off right. How many of them have been kidnapped and dragged to Africa? and put in chains and put in slavery and they couldn't speak English because their tongue would get cut out or their genitals would get cut off and then 400 and some odd years later they speak in uh, African dialects fluently. None. Mm. None. I had to say that brother because I know what the people are thinking when they hear this on YouTube. <laughs> you guys been in America long enough you should be speaking English well. Well, you motherfuckers have been in Africa long enough. You should be speaking 1,000 different dialects that we speak in Africa. So shut the fuck up and get the fuck out of my face with that bullshit. Anyway, go on. Oh, by the way, those, those last two sentences, that's English for the rich. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I got well, one more question for you, Professor Griff. Um, you know, you gave us, you, you went into some, uh, some, some history that I'm sure a lot of our people weren't aware of, the laughing barrels. Um, you know, you talked about the black codes, and mm -hmm. I, I, hope, I hope a lot of people go and look up this stuff and research it. And um, it makes me think about something. We, you know, we never got the chance to talk about the Kanye West situation. Um, mm. You know, we was busy doing what we was doing. But one of the things Kanye Kanye's known for, you know, his fashion line. You know, he, he's known for being a creative, and you know, his music, and you know, him being a visionary, and you know, he wants to have a clothing line, all types of ideas he says he has. And uh, one of the things he says is that you can't focus on slavery. You have to be a creative. You have to look toward the future. You have to think toward the future. So some people get upset, not upset when you talk about the black codes or, you know, the laughing barrel, but they feel as though in order for, in order for us to be as creative and as innovative, as we once were, we can't continue to look to the past, Professor Griff, about the laughing barrel and about the, we have to think to the future in order to be creative. So this is what I guess Kanye West is coming with and a lot of people's coming with, with this free thought movement. They want to look toward the future. They want to be futurist. They want to be the, like Nikola Tesla, not Nikola Tesla, um, this, this new guy, um, uh, the, the guy, what's his name? Elon Musk. Uh, and, and come up with these inventions and stuff like that. They want to, you know, be the next Steve Jobs and invent the next iPad, and they feel as though they can't if they keep thinking about slavery. What would you say to that type of mindset in a brother like Kanye West, Professor Griff? Well, well first of all, brother, it's hypocrisy at its, at its, at its, at its highest. Uh, I, the reason why I say that, brother Rich, is because everyone that I know of that I looked at their work and said, oh, wow, okay. I stepped away from it. Then when I reapproach it and look at it again, including Charles Gambino, recently, I did it today. I was sitting with some musicians, and we were going over some music. And, you know, the Bruno Mars, the Charles Gambino, you always hear us in these songs from back in the day. I defy anyone right now. Pop this song. Everyone always goes back, Brother Rich. You're a producer, Brother Rich. I heard some of your work. All, all of us go back to see what was that vibe back in the day because we want to get inspired by it right along. That's right. Yeah. So the whole idea of Kanye West saying, let's not stay stuck on A, B, and C and what happened to black people, whatever, whatever, whatever. Well, why don't you go tell Jewish people that, Kanye West? You see, you won't. Because the day you stand up before the world, on TMZ and say to Jewish people and say to the world that the, hel the Holocaust was a choice that Jewish people made, you know, they, you know they would shut your ass down. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> for real. Hold on for a second. Let's have a moment of silence for Kanye West. <laughs> <laughs> they would shut that Negro down. You mean to tell me you got your black ass on TV and said that slavery was a choice? You know if you would have said that. The Holocaust for Jewish people was a choice that Jewish people made. 
You know they will shut you down. You be apologizing from now on, Kanye West. So, no, we're not going to fall for that. We're not going to fall for that, brother. Rich. That's hypocrisy. All of us, including myself, when you listen to what my band does with Seven Octaves, my body of work, you can say, oh, I can see he was influenced by Earth, Wind, and Fire. He was influenced by James Brown and Sly and the Family Stone and Miles Davis. You understand? He was influenced by Thessalonius Monk. Oh, I, I, okay, that little riff right there, I know where he got that from. Gladys Knight did that in her song, Midnight Train to Georgia. You understand what I'm saying? We always go back. That's the reason why we had museums, brother. This is the reason why we had a goddamn history channel. Because we're always going back to study what we did. This is why we, were, this is why we revere the ancestors. Because they left us books written in stone, as Ashwa Kwesi teaches us. You understand what I'm saying? This is why when Noko Rashidi and, and Anthony Browder going into the earth and traveling around the globe to dig up our past because we had to hide from some people that was coming on the planet. We saw them coming. So we hid cities. We hid certain things from them. Now we're having to go back. You understand what I'm saying? So the his, history is important. The past is important. We draw energy and influence and, and inspiration from the past while we're in the present in order to create a future. Mm. Mm. Every okay. people does every people does that. Mm. When you go into these uh, institutions of higher learning, they're always studying the great thinkers of the past. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. It's a common thing that people do this in their culture. There's nothing wrong with you being creative, Kanye West. But why do you gotta disrespect black people while you being creative? Just be creative. You understand what I'm saying? And do, do us a favor, bro. Take your meds, man. You understand what I'm saying? Because truly, I don't care what nobody else had to say about you, Kanye West. You on the Samai control, so you on some MK, ultra MK Delta type shit. Because you exhibiting that kind of behavior. And I've studied it long enough to know what that behavior looked like. Mm-hmm. That dude is on something. He's been, he's been having a meltdown for the last five years. And for you to turn around and say you just love Donald Trump, Bro, no jump off ass wife don't even agree with you, bro. You know what she had to say about it? No, she didn't even no. she didn't even agree with the Negro. She said, "Nah, that's not me. That's him talking." Because wow. nah, you don't you don't represent the Kardashians, dude. Speak for yourself. In northeast, northwest, and southwest, whatever the child name is, probably don't agree with him either. Mm. Lol. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, uh, I definitely appreciate you giving us this history lesson tonight, Professor Griff, man. Oh, give thanks. I really appreciate you, Brother Rich. And uh, we're going to continue this whether I'm on World Star or wherever I'm at because this, what we're doing, is important to the people. And I hear it from people every single time we post something, Brother Rich. At the time that we was away from this, people were like, yo, where y'all at, bro? <laughs> truck, drivers, truck drivers were calling me like, look, man, seriously? I don't know what you're doing, but you and brother Rich got that. Y'all got to go back on, man. I'm serious, man. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely a beautiful thing. Shout out to all the truck drivers and all of the people that have those jobs where y'all just put the headphones on and listen to what me and brother Rich got to say. What, whatever, whoever brother Rich interviews on his channel. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just one of those individuals that, 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 um, that this, this conversational piece with brother, me and brother Rich have morphed into something that we're doing because we're fulfilling a need that we feel that we have to do to help educate and raise the vibrational pitch of our thinking into the thinking of the creator. We're doing what we was put here to do. You kind of think, man, five years ago, I didn't even know you, Brother Rich. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? For real. Our, our paths crossed, and here we are, and we're doing this work that we have to do together. You understand what I'm saying? We're we just going to do it until we decide not to. So like I yeah. said, whether I'm on World Star or whatever I'm doing, we gotta continue this seriously. Indeed, indeed, man. I wanna tell tell the people, man, make sure y'all sign up to my Patreon site, show support, man, independent media, so I could continue to bring brothers like Professor Griff, uh Red Pill or you know, whoever, Professor James Smalls, whoever on the program, make sure you go to patreon.com slash blackmagic three six three and show support. Let the people know how to reach you, Professor Griffin, what you got going on. Yeah, people, they know they can call me at 678-557-2919. Um, I'm in the lab right now. 
um, doing my third installment with my band, The Seventh Octave, and um, working with a couple of people in California on the film, man. So if people still want to donate to the film, you can go to www.paypal.me, that's M-E, forward slash Professor Griff Corporation, or they could just call me or text me at 678-557-2919, Brother Rich. Listen, Brother Rich, I'm bringing Terminator X in, and me and Terminator X are doing the history of hip-hop in the ATL June 23rd in Little Five Points at Soul Village right next to Moon's Music. Save the date, y'all, June 23rd. If you anywhere in the, in the ATL or anywhere in the area, come on and come check us out, man. Uh, y'all can call me for tickets, 678-557-2919. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be in New Orleans, man, mm. uh, for June, for June, June 19th, for, um, June 10th. Um, it's gonna be an interesting thing, man, because it's, New Orleans is a very unique kind of place, and it's been calling me back, uh, for a minute, man. So, me and Soleil are gonna go back down and we're gonna participate in this June 10th celebration. If people want more information about that, um, Definitely just hit me up at 678-557-2919. And just donate whatever you can donate to the Oculus, to the Oculus film. I'm pulling pennies and nickels and dimes together, brother. Rich. Right. But I'm getting, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm getting it done. Shout out to the good people over there at, at, at World Star Hit Radio, man. Um, they called me to a couple of meetings, man, and these brothers are young. These brothers have been inspired by what you and I have been doing. Brother Rich, and they've been following me for a long time, they said. I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah. So they said, listen, it's about time we gave back, yeah. Professor Griff. So this yeah. is what we're going to do. Uh, so I uh, talk to me. So we're going to make it happen June 6th is my first day over there, man. So I'm going to make some things happen, man. That's I said, up, I man. told them, I said, listen, I'm not holding back. So <laughs> y'all can't stand the heat. <laughs> you understand know what I'm saying? But they can deal with it. They're good people, man. That, that's what's up, man. Much success to that, my brother. Once again, family, this is Brother Rich, Professor Griff. Back once again. Thanks for tuning in. We signing out, family. We're going to see you next week. Peace. Peace. Order more acid, more than four tablets, portal door passage, born before mortal war happened. We were lords way before we were poor black men. Now we like Catherine, only having four Jacksons. Sword of pure magic, slaughter four dragons. Heat like corduroy fabric, door to door tactics. Easy like tortoise on boarded floor backspins. Rapping like the man that created it, and I just play with it. Shine radiant, raising it, sunbathing it. Voice tone sharper than razor tip when I aim it at mega lifts, make them raise and lift. You can't relate to this, even if you. You paint a pic of me and you and somehow make the faces switch I like to babysit, throw made a baby skin Donated by natives that procreate in sin They gon' need to raise the rim They gon' need a cage in that gymnasium I play the wind, Will still Chamberlain Put the globe on my middle finger and made it spin They gon' need to raise the rim They gon' need the cage in that gymnasium I play to win, Will still Chamberlain Even Damien and Satan is afraid of him I heard the devil's Tasmanian Raps made them spin fast, vast hailing winds Abstract radiance, underneath my crack cranium is gas radium Hash Cascadian, cash cascading in At the end of the movie, the crack baby wins Pack track stadiums, clap clap praising him Tap that waitress, have crack crap